Thanks for tuning in to From Nothing, the show that goes deep with proven health and wellness founders to find out what it really took to go from zero to one in the slow moving, highly regulated and massive health and wellness market. On this episode, we're joined by Susan Conover, co-founder and CEO of Lumen DX. Lumen DX helps primary care physicians better address skin conditions through AI and ML. We chat with Susan about a broad range of topics from non-dilutive grant funding to how to find data to train your models, to working within FDA regulations and approval requirements. Let's dive in. So why don't we start um, really quickly, just like introduce yourself and, and introduce your company as well. Sure. So uh, I'm Susan Conover, co-founder and CEO of Lumen DX. We um, basically like the problem that we're addressing is that skin issues, everyone has them. Um, it's in one out of every four primary care visits, um, but PCPs get about a week of training in uh, skin disease in medical school. So we help enable them to basically have the visual expertise of a dermatologist to be able to make the right choice for every person who has a skin issue every time using AI and computer vision, of course. And um, yeah, and so, so I'm trained as mechanical engineer, worked in management consulting and really missed building things. So I came back to school to MIT to go deep in that topic. And, you know, I've had melanoma three times. So I decided, is it just a me problem or <laughs> does it impact other people? Let's explore this topic. Uh, I learned it affects a lot of people. Now it's not just melanoma. It's psoriasis, eczema, tons of different conditions, but decided to nerd out on skin disorders and just have not stopped doing that. Wow. Super cool. So did you go back to school with the intention of researching skin disease? No, I had, I just picked, I was, I was originally doing like design for developing countries work and considered automotive or various different <laughs> avenues and directions. Um, but I think it was sort of my original thesis, even though I didn't know it was sort of designed for good. And one really great way to deploy that is in the healthcare space. And so it kind of just figured itself out. Oh, very cool. All right. I, I've, I have a feeling we're going to come back to that. But um, before we do, tell us like a little bit about where you are at with Lumen DX. What, like what sure. stage? Yeah. So um, it's a bit weird because we're in machine learning, I, I think, but um, we, we incorporated a few years ago. We went through the Mass Challenge program in Boston. We went through the Techstars Boston program in 2019 and um, raised a, a small amount of angel money after that. Uh, hit our milestone as a company of like bringing in a certain amount of data, um, which data in our space is pretty scarce and hard to access and hard to prepare and package in a way that it's useful. And so we hit that milestone. We raised about 2 million last summer and we have a big product launch this summer um, and getting our first paying, uh, paying customers and users. And so I'm feel like we're just on the cusp of a lot of really amazing things, but I can't be like, okay, this is how we raised, um, or this is how we got to 1 million ARR. So <laughs> keep everything with a grain of salt. No, that's awesome. And um, congrats. That sounds like a really awesome, exciting summer ahead. So um, what, like, what did your first, uh, uh, when, when were you actually founded or when did you start working on it? Um, I started working on it in like the one in my graduate thesis at MIT, and then also continued that research independently at a university in Singapore, SUTD. And then I came back and incorporated August 2017. 2017. Okay. So, um, what what did like the first? First of all, let's talk about the research aspect. Like, what what did research encompass for you? Sure. Um, so. My uh, actual program is called system design and management. And so I did a lot of like error finding and zooming out and mapping stakeholders uh, because like system design and management is sort of dealing with complexity. Um, the origin of the program is actually like the military and automotive manufacturers realized that things were kind of like projects were spiraling out of control and it had human elements and technical elements like, oh, like the big dig i don't know if you know 
that famous case in Boston where it took I don't know, like four times the amount of money and at least twice as long to complete. And so, um, so basically interviewed a lot of different stakeholders, dermatologists, primary care physicians, and patients to understand what are overall problems in, you know, identifying skin issues. Um, and also did a technical research analysis of like, what are the different technologies you can use to identify and distinguish different skin issues. Um, and then did a literature review to understand um, how does this field work? And also what are the accuracies at different levels of care delivery and learn some really interesting um, characteristics, but also sort of validated that it's a big problem. It's a chronic problem. And um, that it's been really hard to figure out how do we both build a product that works make money, not violate any regulatory issues, and um, find a user who really loves the product. And I think a lot of times, like uh, buying Superhuman, all of those all of those things are the same person. But when you're <laughs> in healthcare, often three or four of them are separated. Um, and so figuring out how to figure, you know, how to align all these different stakeholders. Also, we had to pivot away from melanoma, which was hard for me because that's, you know, where my personal passion came from. But I mean, we're using, we're building the same technology we can use to address that in the future and decided to, you know, zig when other people are zagging. And so explore an area that's not as, as, as crazy as it sounds, sexy as oncology <laughs> is in healthcare, um, because there's so much funding around it, um, but decided to, to focus on other conditions that uh, affect a lot of people. And, you know, they're just not, they're not this, you know, urgent, oh my God, someone could die type of issue. And, and you are a mechanical engineer by training. You talked a little bit about the technical analysis and feasibility mm -hmm. of it. Did you teach yourself to code on the software side or how did you do that? Well, I originally coded as part of mechanical engineering training, um, but no, I didn't do coding. I, it was more about finding the right partner and finding the right co-founder slash partners. Like if you can do that, you can build a start. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's oversimplification, but it's, it's really hard to find the right people who you share the same values with. Um, but have complementary skill sets. Often you already, you know, other mechanical engineers, you know, other people who are in your field um, that you have like a strong relationship with because it's really hard and, um, and like has the same risk tolerance and risk appetite that you do <laughs> as a rare, a rare person. How, how did you find that person for, for you, you guys? So, um, so I got this really great advice from a, a partner at Y Combinator that was like, that I was trying to find a co-founder and he said, who are the people who are, you've already had a relationship with for years who you think could do this? Not who will say yes, but who really have the chops to like work with you and give them the open, honest, heartfelt appeal of like, it's going to be really hard, <laughs> but we have a an amazing opportunity to work on this together like let's figure it out it's you and me babe sort of <laughs> thing um and so i um uh my actually someone i met in improv in boston six years ago i think improv does attract its fair amount of software engineers who are like i would like to have social connection <laughs> and um so that's originally how pranav and i met and he's been a really great um, really great partner through the years. Um, yeah. So, uh, really like you already know this person, don't try to hire them. Don't try to meet someone new and say, Oh, you know, machine learning, you know, find someone who you already have a trusted relationship with. Um, okay. So you go and you do your research side, you incorporate, you said August, 2017, did I get that right? Oh yeah, exactly. Okay. So August, 2017, uh, how did you decide to make the leap to actually incorporate and, and then what did you go do in your first call it three months? Uh, it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, uh, how did I make the decision to incorporate? I think I had done research here in Singapore and then like 
joined up with a research group that was doing something similar at MIT after coming back and just sort of made the decision, you know, like there's still some stuff to figure out. There's still a lot of stuff to figure out. We don't, you know, have a paying customer, but it's worth figuring it out. And like, let's, let's take the leap. And also I think I wanted to apply for an NSF grant and you have to have uh, a company incorporated <laughs> to do that. So we did that. We didn't end up getting the grant, uh, but it, I think like mentally, once you have already started the company, you're in a different mental space than like, well, uh, maybe I will, but I also have consulting as a backup plan and all that stuff. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that grant process. That's something that we've never done. Like, why did you decide to go through a grant process? And like, what was the actual process like? Sure. Um, so we just, we're, we're about to do a resubmission to the NSF. Um, uh, it's really like, like regular fundraising. It's really about figuring out what are the strategic objectives of the the organization that's giving out grants and like talking to them in advance even though you're not super supposed to die you know, it's tricky because they're supposed to be unbiased right when they review your application but that doesn't exist um and um but basically like the standard nsf sbir phase one application you apply there are like three windows per year depending on the division uh every um division of the government, like um, the NSF or the NIH or the DOD has Congress mandated amount of money that they have to give for this SBIR program. So there's like a lot of funding um, for it. So a lot of people go for it, but basically like, if you want funding to, to build something new that hasn't existed before, grants can be a really great direction to go with that because that's specifically what this grant money is for now writing the perfect application we're still figuring out um but it's about knowing what do they want to fund what do they not want to fund i think previously we had a task in our grant of like licensing data but really the nsf doesn't want to pay for you to go get data they want to pay for the technical development so that was a learning curve and um, and it takes like four months in order to hear from them if you're accepted or not, and then you can resubmit, but that it's just a slow process to where um, for us, it makes sense as a strategy in parallel with uh, dilutive financing because the first grant is like 250,000, but if you do your milestones on that, the second grant 750,000, and then for the, the government, the DOD, in military ones it can get even higher than that and so it's just it just makes sense as if you're building something new and innovative that can impact the world in a big way to just go after some non-dilutive money if you have the bandwidth to write a good application or you have like the support to do that okay so um let's transition then into the business today mm -hmm. what um who, who do you sell to and, and and like knowing you're about to light that up like who will be your buyer and who will be your user and who are all the different stakeholders yeah so we have two primary segments of buyers and we we, we don't have them paying right now and so a <laughs> million asterisk but the first one is um telemedicine companies like um like Babylon Healthcare, who they're they're doing primary care. They already deal with a lot of skin issues. They've often raised more than forty million at this stage, so they're they're dealing with actually quite a lot of volume of patients, and they sell into um, employers, basically like Amazon or Walmart or one of those folks is like a PM PM structure per per member per person covered per month. And um, and that there's a lot of telemedicine that's not like this digital front door that has a different payment structure, like being paid per, per consult every time a dependent has an issue. That's a really bad fit for our company. And we just had to learn that by talking to a lot of different folks. 
um, but learned that that's a great direction because a lot of them have like chat bots where they address skin today and they just ask a patient a ton of questions like where's the rash how long has it been there and you just can't really get to the right diagnosis the picture is truly worth a thousand words in this case so um so this can really help to support their goals of automating healthcare and making it more scalable um the other direction so i guess the buyer is the telemedicine company. Um, they've actually expressed interest in acquiring a company in our space. It's a big enough problem for them, which is to us good feedback to hear um, that they, um, oh, so the buyer is a company, the user is their primary care physician on the back end. Um, in some cases, it could be the patient though. And so that's a, a future build way, at least a year in the future, but that could potentially work because they have like chatbot triage systems. And um, yeah, beneficiary is the patient, the dependent. And then um, the second category, very different, a lot longer, looks like sales cycle, um, but seems to be very worthwhile is there's about 15% of the US healthcare system is fully at risk, meaning, that the provider who delivers the care is the same as the person paying for it and they have the integrated systems. And so Kaiser Permanente is kind of like the biggest um, biggest one on the block. Uh, it would take years to sell into them. <laughs> so they're not our, not our group, but basically that user is that primary care physician, beneficiary is the patient, of course. And uh, the payer is likely the organization that um, does most likely direct contracting with Medicare um, because Medicare has some really innovative structures for um, allowing people that, you know, companies to get paid on a monthly basis to cover patients depending on their level of risk. And so they're sort of have really great ways of incentivizing um, providers that if they're dedicated to it, wanting to reduce costs and they can make that margin. So a lot of it's like Medicare specific. Can, can you talk about what those, what those Medicare ways of payment are? Yeah. So they're kind of complex, but there's old Medicare, which is considered part A and B, which is kind of like direct healthcare costs, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, that's like if you get a, a hip transplant, right? That, that's what happens there. And um, that's just on a, a per, every time a doctor does a thing, they can bill for it and get paid. Um, so that has created a lot of perverse incentives or, you know, if you talk to a doctor, they're not right. They're, <laughs> they're doing the right thing. But when you look at the actual numbers, like referral rates in the US are double what they are in the UK. And so um, there are two primary mechanisms, um, or I guess there are more than that. And they're like different shared structures where like um, uh, a provider can get like 45% upside savings. If they save money, they share the savings directly with Medicare. But if they lose money, they only, they only bear like 25% of that risk, stuff like that. Um, and then there's like the newest like Cadillac models of like, it's, it's, it's two different models. One's called Medicare Advantage, where it's, it's a different sector of Medicare. It, it's not under the Part A and B traditional Medicare structure, but basically in that situation, an organization like Iora Health gets paid every month um, for managing that patient. They have to code that patient correctly. If they have diabetes, making sure <laughs> Medicare knows they have diabetes. So they get paid for that diabetes risk they're taking on. Um, but then there's also a new, the newest mechanism is called direct contracting, which is intended to, um, move traditional fee for service paying per time a thing is done to having that provider take on risk like full full risk and they actually have like 50 percent risk and 100 percent upside downside risk and so um direct contracting companies are the most at risk they're like iora health they're like like kp would be one if if they sort of fit into this um bucket 
Um, and, and because direct contracting and Medicare Advantage, you can actually get paid more if you code the patient correctly, like have them come in and you document all of the conditions that they have. Uh, you, you can shake out like pretty decent profitability. Um, and so it's a really, really growing industry. Like a lot of different startups and established companies are popping up offering Medicare Advantage plans or Medicare. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to take on, right? You know, we're talking about people who have hypertension and diabetes and maybe homebound and like all of these different factors. But if you really can integrate um, like great care and deliver that great care, you can actually get financially rewarded for it. And that's super nice. So it's been like a lot of work for me to try to figure out what are these different Medicare structures in the past month and which ones are aligned for us. And because direct contracting and, and um, Medicare Advantage, a lot of those cases also take on drug risk um, of like, like one of our value props is that we can reduce mistreatment, right? Unnecessary prescriptions. But in a lot of those risk structures, treatments just, uh, prescriptions is just a different category that they don't even worry about. And so um, going full risk for us is our best strategy. And then that's probably six to 12 month sales cycles. So I have my work cut out for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's really cool. So now um, what about the, the regulatory world? Like are, are you guys cleared by the FDA? Do you need to be cleared by the FDA? What does that look like? Yeah. So I feel like a lot of other companies, it's like a clear pathway, right? Like, oh, we're a heart valve. <laughs> so we have to get a class three. That means we're going to have to raise this amount. That means we. for us, we're kind of weird in the sense of like, we can be like, uh, like not a medical device all the way through to like a class three, um, which the um, it's based on precedent of are there products in the market that previously like are comparable with what you do and also the risk that you're taking or like, what's the, what's the consequence that it, the system is wrong, right? Like what's the worst case scenario that could happen if the system is wrong or fails. Um, and then like the risk categories are, are positioned for that. Um, and so for us, um, we, we like, and that's one of the reasons we moved away from melanoma is that like any system that says, oh, you should take a biopsy or, oh, you should refer or oh, like makes a recommendation is a medical device. Um, and all of the outputs of that system, uh, that are useful and actionable are a medical device. But when it comes to rashes and other conditions where we're doing like more advanced visual search to populate the right short list of conditions it's likely to be, and then help that doctor know what questions to ask in order to figure out what they wanna do next for the patient, that's in the category of clinical decision support. And so there are a lot of asterisks with that. Like we have to, um, not make specific recommendations like you need to refer, right? Um, but also uh, we need to, we have to make it explainable, right? Meaning it's um, understandable by that physician and auditable later of like understanding how the machine got to an, its answer and like that physician sort of being able to understand how it got there rather than just black box, which is a lot of machine learning and AI. So it's been um, definitely like threading the needle of figuring out what are the requirements and they're not always clear. And then re regulatory consultants are really expensive, but we've connected to a few regulatory people within our within Mass Challenge and uh, within Techstars that have been really helpful for us being able to make that judgment call to figure out. And and now it's 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 more strategy. Like we realized that if we had a product that's reimbursed, we could get every doctor in the US to use it. <laughs> and they really wanna get paid when they do new things because that's the system. Um, but for now with the like capital involvement and 
FDA approval requirements, we, we think of that as a future market. That's a great market, but a future market. And that for now, focusing on these groups that already take on risk, but you know, want to improve outcomes for patients with skin disorders to get our first customers and be useful as clinical decision support, right? Like really get this, that evidence that we're solving a big problem for doctors before we go to that stage. That's interesting. And, um, with the doctors paying, going back to the, the business model, with the doctors paying, like how do you guys charge physician groups? Um, so physicians don't like <laughs> paying for things in the physician group. This is important. The different person, different stakeholder. How, like, are, how are we thinking about charging them? Is that what you said? Um, considering on like a per physician basis, also potentially like per member per per person per month coverage um uh so that's sort of how these telemedicine companies get paid today and the one of the reasons we're considering that is because panel sizes are really different if a doctor is addressing 200 patients versus 800 right does it make sense for them to be paying the same amount um also considering fully at risk because that's an easy way to get in the door and saying like if we really reduce these this level of cost we get this percentage of it um, probably want to start with PM, PM or per physician per month first. And um, when do you guys think you're going to turn that on? Uh, working to get our first, uh, paying customers in the next like three months. Oh, so. cool. Very soon. Yes. Very soon. <laughs> I had a question about how, how you kind of segmented your customer market. You had initially talked about the telemed companies that are really looking to become very hyper efficient and scale their level of care. And yeah. so automation is, is something that's very intriguing to them. Then you mentioned on the very, very other end of the spectrum, you have like a an HMO, like a Kaiser Permanente, mm -hmm. um, where their sales cycle is multi-year. Mm -hmm. And I, I've definitely spoke with providers there where their risk profile is pretty low. They want some proof behind the thing. They want case studies. Sure. Hence all that. And then in the middle, you mentioned um, other risk-bearing entities like Iora Health mm -hmm. that are smaller than Kaiser, um, and that sales cycle was six to 12 months. Do you view it as that cleanly linear of like, I'm going to first try to sell to these telemeds for efficiency purposes, and that's the value prop, build out case studies, then move my way up the customer food chain? Or like, how do you think about that? Um, yeah, it's a fair question. I think, I mean, how I'm thinking about it in, in increments of like, what are we gonna do in the next year? And that's where a lot of my time and brain is at. Um, and then, right, we have like addressing skin cancer, we have getting a code and getting FDA approval and like all of these other things in the horizon. I, I thought KP could be a good customer. And then I went and talked to a lot of folks there and learned that it's, you know, it's, they do require case studies and a different system who was already implemented and all that information. And so like one thing I really find frustrating about the um, product market fit journey is it's, it's a crawl, right? You have to pick a single segment, talk to a lot of people, new, solution neutral questions and try to figure out what their problems are. And so like, I wish I knew more about colleges and universities or prisons or some of these other markets that are on our radar uh, or like the military, right? That I just don't have sort of the bandwidth to do a full search and figure it out. Otherwise, like we're not gonna ever sell a telemedicine company. Um, but I guess I do view it as like, I think that these risk bearing organizations are 10% of the market. And we need to be able to show our investors cause we're raising around in the fall, at least that we can get like, a, pilot, you know, a few pilots or some sort of like evidence that we'll be able to sell into this market, even if it takes six to 12 months to actually get revenue. Um, but then in parallel, telemedicine companies can move faster and they're more hungry for it. Um, and so need to be able to show that revenue traction there. So I, I guess like, I guess my math is just like with the information I have now, 
um, which is limited. <laughs> and combined with our fundraising um, milestones and goals and like what evidence we need to show, this is these two markets are what I'm pursuing right now. Cool. Yeah, so it's definitely speed to traction is really what you care about right now. And, and these are the, the hottest leads. Yeah, exactly. The, mer the, the, the biggest pants on fire customers who really care. I, I, got, I got one more, like I got, cause I'm really curious about this. Can you actually talk in whatever level of detail you feel comfortable selling into these telemed startups really? I mean, yeah. there's, there's still startups. Yeah. What, what does that process look like? Well, um, I think it's more straightforward, certainly than these large organizations. I mean, for us, it's finding their senior medical director um, and or like really starting off first talking to, you know, a telemedicine physician or someone who's left the company or right one of these like lower stakes connections to sort of get some probing information, learn if it could be an avenue or not, or if it's just not even on the radar of the organization. So like one telemedicine company I talked to on their website, they're like, we don't ever have any chatbots answer your questions. <laughs> we're just, we're all physicians. And I'm just like, okay, this is just the opposite of a technology solution. That's good to know. Uh, and, learn, and learn that that's part of their ethos as a company. And so learn, okay, this is not a good direction for us to go to. Um, and like kind of wish I didn't start with the <laughs> senior medical director and talking to them. It's, it's a bur potentially like burn bridge now, but at least we learned, right? Um, but, and then it's, yeah, senior medical director because they're the ones who understand skin and the volume and the challenges because they're physicians and other stakeholders in the organization like COO or whatever, unless they are a co-founder, they really don't understand the volume or like a product manager or something like that. It's not on their radar. They have to go and check. Um, and um, yeah, and then like understanding what it's like in their system. Um, under, and then I asked a lot of like, probing questions like what are the metrics of success that your leadership team tracks which is uh, such a useful question because then you, you learn like oh patient satisfaction is this and this is how we sell new um business and all you know all that all of those details um and then uh right we, we know we need executive team approval because these are startups they're smaller organizations but at least they Decision making is more concentrated than like KP, where I was told no one can say yes and everyone can say no, which is <laughs> a tough selling environment. Very cool. That, that's super helpful. Thank you. I did hear though, for as like a hot tip to get into some of the larger systems, go through the venture arm, right? Because it's their job to find technology and innovations and fund them if if they're useful for their clinicians. So that can be a good way to nose in and get some or get feedback. Have you, have you seen any success with that yet? Yeah, that's how I nosed into KP. Um, Got it. Yeah, it was super useful. Uh, I haven't really deployed that strategy in other places as much. Um, I should. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the technical guy or the more technical guy, I guess, of the two of us. I imagine a large part of your last four years have been figuring out how to get data and how to train your models. Super, yes. How, how did you find your data? Like what, what sort of hacks did you come up with to get data? <laughs> Are you going to go find the data? <laughs> no, I, um, I don't think so, but I imagine there's other Tell things. us all your secrets, yeah. please. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. Um, we tried a lot of different methods. In the pandemic, one thing that was more effective than we certainly ever thought it would be is reaching out to international doctors um, because they care about skin of color. And so we specifically sort of positioned around improving health equity. Um, and the, the pain point for dermatologists internationally is a lot bigger because they're like, we have one dermatologist per 50,000 people. Even if I worked every day, <laughs> 14 hours a day, I can't like, we can't possibly deliver care to the people who need it. And so there's just, I think more urgency in, in making more scalable and accessible 
Healthcare internationally. Are you guys going international from day one or, or no? No, that would be really, really hard to be too much, right? Like it's di- divergent uh, focus kills or slowly, <laughs> slowly leeches startups. But, um, but we have had the attitude of like, let's make sure our AI is highly accurate across all skin tones. And it's you know, frankly been a lot easier to get international data than it has been in the US. A lot of conversations end with, oh, well, don't you have to get patient consent for all of the cases? And I, you know, I'm not gonna go message a million of my patients over the last 20 years to, you know, <laughs> like a lot of what she, discussions are, and those are all surmountable, but it can, you know, if someone just decides, oh, I'm not, this is not of interest um, versus thinking of data as like, oh, we can actually use this data to help improve health equity uh, <laughs> through making AI that's unbiased versus humans, which are very biased. Um, and <laughs> so I guess it's just, it's sort of like your risk tolerance a bit. Um, but then we found international doctors who have been really great partners, even though it's a lot of work to figure out who are the ones who are gonna resonate with us. Um, and so building up that persona, that customer profile of like, what are the characteristics of someone? Like if they have a undergrad degree in engineering or a clinical informatics degree, or they've published a certain number of, you know, stuff like that um, to figure out if they're going to resonate. And, and then we, we previously had like nine different avenues we could have gone down um and we've tested various ones one's pharma right because they have a ton of data from clinical trials one's individual doctors i've digitized a ton of old codachrome slides (laughs) this is over fifty thousand at this point which is painful but really your skin looks the same 30 years ago as it does today and um and then some partnerships with larger hospitals in the u.s so the challenge was like a lot of hospitals in the u.s changed from innovation departments to covid departments right the innovation people were specifically responsible for deploying and so now they're shifting back and can start to think what do we need in the next five years rather than what do we need in the next two weeks but um a lot of our data deals got paused in the pandemic. So we had to roll up our sleeves and get creative. Um, but yeah, now we have, you know, like an integrated system of Dropbox and Google Drive. And right now there's a hard drive in the air flying from Bolivia to the US with 120,000 photos. And so we just, we just figure out how to, <laughs> if someone has a slow upload speed, we'll figure out a way around it. That's fun. And and um, I mean, are most of these deals like with like one, two doctors at a time, or are they with like larger systems of dozens, hundreds, thousands of doctors at a time? Yeah, it eventually, you know, frankly, it's just shaken out that individual doctors being able to decide on their own versus trial by committee um, has moved a lot faster, right? We have a deal with a major institution in Germany that we've, you know, had everything we thought we needed last summer. And it's still like legals reviewing it. And <laughs> you gotta have a doctor who has a lot of stamina as well to continue to be the champion despite all the bureaucracy. Um, and so I think like things may may have I can only speak to like us licensing data. If if we were like having a product that those doctors that are working with us would use right away, like our our products really more for primary care physicians and dermatologists have the data. So it's, it's definitely a mismatch versus radiology AI or path AI or other companies where we're solving the problem for the person who's doing the partnership. Right. I would, I would figure out a way to do that instead of what we're yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah. and, and so what do those deals look like? Like are you, do you just pay them a straight up license fee or um, it depends on the deal. Uh, in some cases, right, they do want the app for their residents or their, you know, uh, or, you know, their PCPs in other cases, right? It's, you know, more of an equity structure. In other cases, it's more like cover our costs for um, being able to pull out the data, um, you know, and then in, in many cases, it's a license fee. 
um, to be able to use their um, data in perpetuity. We don't really do deals that are like, well, you can use it for two years and then you have to come back. It's just like too much. Yeah, very generic overarching, but to the target audience of, of this show, what would you tell a founder starting out kind of more or less in your shoes, but day one, like, oh, please do this. Please don't do this. Number one, um, look at all the people you've known over your life in high school and college, whatever, who would be good partners. Uh, Cause having a great partner allows you to just move a lot faster and have a lot more impact. Um, and with a trusted relationship, uh, number two, every time you sign a contract, put it in a folder, um, you probably save a lot of money on your first financing round. Uh, then there'd be obvious things like make sure it's a real pain point for the person, you know, like don't build something on your own, like go talk to a million customers. Um, I'd say the i program, we got $50,000 to do more, like, you know, really amazing coaching along with market research of our startup. And that was really helpful for pivoting out of melanoma and learning that was an important thing to do. Um, Techstars is really great. You guys already know that. Um, but like the hardest, hardest round of funding is the first first rounds because you have the least amount of evidence, uh, especially if you're a first time founder. So Techstars kind of allows you to like jump over a lot of the challenges that previously may anchor you down. Um, uh, sell the big vision, never, yeah. People would be like, what do you do? And you wanna say like, oh, AI for dermatology. But that doesn't mean anything to most people. So always illustrate the problem and why it matters before you talk about what you're doing. Otherwise, you'll just like lose the opportunity to hire amazing people, get investors excited about what you're doing, right? It's, it's really about the dream. Uh, I say that cavalierly, but like that was a big learning for me in, in Techstars. Um, what else? Um, yeah, take real stock of your life. I think like, there's something I heard someone else say, I think the founder of HubSpot and it really resonated with me. People always overestimate the downside of if their startup fails, uh, disproportionate to the upside. I think that's really classic is you never really think through all the upside. People are wired to think about risk because they want to survive, right? It's, and so um, just if you're considering starting a company or you've already started a company, it's your job to make sure you do the things that are gonna kill you and like make sure they're handled. But that's like 1% of things. And then there's like 90% of the middle shit, right? That you just like, doesn't super matter if you do it. And it's your responsibility to figure out the 5% of things that if you do them, they'll actually really move the needle for your, you and your company and your impact. And so um, figure out the 5%. Then maybe on that note, because I don't, we, we have yet to interview someone who's, who's like still very, very, very early on in, in the journey. What's your 5% that maybe we or anybody listening could help you with? Oh, my 5%? Yeah. Getting some connections to our first primary care groups to work with that could be in like rural environments who are or community care environments who have less, less access to germ because they have more urgent issues. Um, and um, there's a person named Debbie Black that runs the Melanoma Research Foundation in Boston, in, in New York. I'm trying to connect to her. Okay. All right, All right Debbie. Yeah, we'll find Debbie. <laughs> All right, last, okay. last, last, last question. If you weren't doing Lumen DX today, what would you be doing? Oh, surfing. <laughs> <laughs> So I have like my five jobs that I would be doing if money didn't matter. Um, but one's like being a comedian. Um, so on my bucket list, the only thing I have on it is this Edinburgh Fringe Festival um, that I'm going to try to go to. It's like a big, big thing of like 
fun like out there sort of comedy and so I guess I don't, I'm very far away from being like a person who could make money from comedy but I just super love it cool well thank you so much for taking the time oh yeah thank you guys for having me what'd you learn I mean I like I had read about Medicare so but it was always nice to get yeah the breakdown it's nice more of the collision of worlds um from direct primary care to <laughs> oh the world starts at primary care that's for sure yeah everything seems to start in primary care uh but then the emphasis on risks bearing the the target customer thing i think it's got to be i mean we, we know it on the employer side we have yet to deal with it on the clinical side like what she's doing but whew. That's hard. Um, the, uh, yeah, can't really speak too much about the training data because that's the secret sauce, but flying hard drives from Bolivia. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's just a lot of grunt, you know, yeah. find data wherever you can. And I like the in the international aspect. I bet, like, you know, there's a lot of providers here in the United States that are just, like, they've been crushed with requests and i bet a lot of those international folks haven't and have the the equity piece on their mind more so I bet yeah it, i bet it's a better sell yeah i thought that was really cool um actually I, the impact of non-dilutive financing we've run into sbir nsf grant conversations a trillion times i think our gut is to always say oh don't do that um perhaps it's too flippant perhaps maybe it is like do that though she did hint at how onerous the application process is yeah i mean i think my gut on it is always man speed whoo speed yeah exactly um but i i like i i i appreciated her her sort of yeah, speed, but can you run a dual track, right? Like, right. can you do some dilutive financing while you're doing SBIR in order to get to a place where, like, you're still going to be moving along, you're, like, the train's still leaving the station, but if you happen to get the SBIR, like, cool, like, even better. Right. I mean, it's a million in total, she, yeah. she hinted at, yeah. at least for her 250 up front, 750 if you hit your milestone. So that's meaningful at an early stage. Yeah. She did say, haven't perfected the application process. So this sounds like a process that's yeah, a process. Yeah, totally. Um, the FDA clearance stuff was really interesting to me. Still a, yes. a place where I like need to at least understand the classifications at a better level. Like a one, yeah, like like the, one level the deeper. The clinical decision support, support yeah. thing was really interesting yeah. versus uh, a indication of you need to refer out or this is yep. what it might be is as an actual medical device. Yep. It, yeah, now, now I just, my, my first instinct was like, yep, yeah, that's going to slow down like software innovation that slows it down, yeah. hands down, yeah. no matter what. But of course that's a, it's a, it's a necessary a good thing in some aspects. Yeah. yeah. And then a terrible thing in other aspects. So my, my one medical dream is maybe you have to be very much clinical decision support. And even then they don't have the, I thought the incentives with her target customer, the way she was thinking about her target customers was interesting because it was a pure incentive base. And I think more and more, that's the word that comes up in these conversations with healthcare founders is focus on the incentives. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. And I think that's more so than other types of startups. Yeah. Cool. Anything from you? That's it. No, I mean, I, I like I agree on the uh, the fundraising piece. I think is really interesting to think through. The FDA piece, I think, is really interesting. Um, the data piece is still really interesting to me. Like, I, I mean, it. You know, one thing that came to my mind when when we were talking about the data piece, or when she was talking about the data piece, that I thought was pretty. I don't know, maybe, maybe insightful. It was, um, 
in technology, we always talk about how every company is a data company and data can be a moat and blah, 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 blah. Well, actually like doctors, doctors are, are a data company. They just haven't yet thought of themselves that way. And it's almost like, what if you could essentially like build the platform for a physician group to like sit on top of their data, whether, you know, anything in their EHR, whether radiology or just notes or what, or labs or whatever. Um, and it's like build like the, I'm, I always come back to this, build like the AWS service that allows any other developer to come through and just get access to the data that they want to get access to in the same way that AWS has common data sets. Their data sets are free, but like you could charge for, actually, I think some of their data sets you charge for, um, you could literally just put that on top and then like rev share with, with a physician group. Like they want to make extra money. Like, cool. Anybody can come get it. They can make extra money. HIPAA concerns abound, but yeah. Yeah. Then, like, yeah, maybe HIPAA, but what would, HIPAA concerns. I like as a patient, I'd be like, and this kind of comes down to the, uh, well, really anywhere the people are the product products. It's like, do I get a, any cut of that? Is that meaningful? That's not that meaningful. Do I care? Maybe I don't care. But your data is being sold today. Do you don't care. My health data? Yeah. Is that true? Well, I mean, just take what she said. She's going to physician groups and buying data. How dare they? That's my skin. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't really love that. If I saw zero benefit out of it, I don't know that I would really love that. As a patient? Yeah. But you, you're literally like, in that position wanna, right I, now. I, yeah, but now, well, maybe, maybe, first of all. Um, and knowing about it, I don't love it. That's the whole thing is that most people don't know. I don't think most people would know if you built a company and sold it to people who needed access to health data. Now we just got back to the privacy conversation. Yeah. I don't want to go down that hole, but I feel like that. I honestly, I feel like that. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll be too flippant, but like feels like you can solve for that just in the exact same way that people are solving for that today. Like yelling at each other. <laughs> no, anonymize the data. <laughs> yeah people are still there's moral outrage about privacy on the internet some people say and and i i think it is right people are loud about it but in the end you don't really care yes yes that's probably true so i'm in about an hour i will forget about this conversation <laughs> yeah so yeah it could be interesting to treat ehrs as data pools yep. that if you could make it easy to anonymize that data and pull it out the problem is i think like, I guess it'll solve itself in decades, probably, of structuring the unstructured data and making it all accessible. But yeah. yeah, you could start with some pretty obvious ones. It would be cool if Fire allowed not only patient enabled, so like patient uh, authing in gives you everything, but then if a doctor authed in, it gave you everything anonymized. Them. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is like the health information exchanges. And actually, I guess a lot of what I'm talking about, period, is health, health information exchanges. We need to get a company on that does health information exchanges. That would be fun. Yeah. They're all, like, well, I don't know. <laughs> they all seem to be like legacy, old school. They started as nonprofits. The state dictated them, and then some of them turned to for-profit organizations. Like, I wonder. But yeah, we should do that. Yeah, I have I have one person in mind. We'll see. 